SC Sancho, Coach Lavelle Moen, the, the legend right here. Man, appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having me. What, what age were you when you moved to um, Raleigh? Man, we moved third grade. Third grade? Third grade, yeah. Is that kind of where you, you would say you found your passion for the game? Yeah. Really? Um, here? You know, it was crazy, man. Like, I really had to put in the work towards basketball. You know, I just always engaged into it, but my mom didn't really want me at the park because every weekend there was so much violence that was happening up there and you got to remember this was the inception of crack cocaine right so yeah. this is when crack is going rampant most people are selling the drug to take care of their family mm. or using the drug to deal with the fact that they can't yeah. as kids we're in the midst of that and the drug dealers are now trying to come recruit us to indulge in that and so it's a, it's a tumultuous time for everyone right how did you say you avoided it you know i know a lot of people are caught up kind of in that you know, realm. How, how do you think you avoided it and kind of stay locked in on your journey? Man, um, I had a praying grandmother, man. I had a mother, man, who just never compromised. And she didn't really play no games with that. And I'm so happy for that. When we moved down here, I remember riding by on Raleigh Boulevard and I saw a bunch of kids out there playing. I was like, Mom, I want to go out there and play. And it was the boys' club. Yeah. So she took me and my brother, and my brother's five years older. <laughs> And she wanted to sign us up, and they said the price is seven fifty. So she walked out because she thought it was like seven hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, they was like, nah, seven dollars and fifty cents for the year, <laughs> right? And so she's like, really? <laughs> that don't even make sense, right? Yeah. But what the boys club did, it provided me, you know, um, constructive time. They taught me cooking, life skills, taught mm -hmm. us racial relations because. There were so many different variations of culture there, so you really had to get to know people. And we were kids, so when you're kids, you're not going into places with a, 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 a racist heart or, you know what I'm saying, like yeah. a prejudiced heart. You're just yeah. kids. Y'all just play together. Y'all just do whatever. And so I met people from various backgrounds. But the most important thing that it did, it taught me sports, but it really taught me that it was a glorified daycare. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So most of the crime <laughs> yeah. that occurred in the hood and in the streets mm. with kids, it occurred mm. during the hours of three and six. Yeah. So now my time was occupied between three and six because I was at the boys club and you know it's the best thing that ever happened to me. From my neighborhood in forty years, mm. six kids made it to college. The one common denominator that all of us had was the boys club. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So it was <laughs> You know, yeah. I'm willing to put those statistics up. So you went, so you graduated from Enlo, and then you went to where we are now, <laughs> the NC Central. And uh, you're the third all-time leading scorer here at NC Central. A lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. You know, like, um, I, think, I think I think it's really, like, it's cool that you were a player here, and then now you're also a legendary coach here, a legendary player and coach. Yeah. That's like a, a dynamic you don't see often. Yeah. What was kind of your development process through college as a player? before, you know, we get into coaching? My goal, my number one goal in life was to make sure my mom never had to work again. Mm -hmm. So I had an immense focus, right? Because I had grew up and seen things that many people my age didn't see. I knew my family and people in my hood was dependent on me to come back and make something of themselves. I attended North Carolina Central and they never recruited me, mm -hmm. right? It was the craziest thing. I was scheduled to go to Wake Forest out of high school. Coming out, I think I was like, top 40 in the nation. My AU team was number one in the nation. Myself and Jerry Stackhouse and Jeff Capel, we were loaded. Right? Yeah. So, you know, everybody came to see Jerry Stackhouse, Chuck Corn Carnegie, and I, it was oftentimes I led the team to scoring. So I was recruited at a high level. Wake Forest wanted me to sign early, and I didn't sign early. And so towards the latter part of my senior year, that scholarship was taken by Rusty LaRue and Barry Canton. Mm -hmm. So... Greg Jackson, who was the coach here, he came to my house and he knocked on the door. And I never forget, like all the all the OGs escorted him into my house, right? Because they wouldn't even let him in the neighborhood, right? <laughs> yeah, oh, right? that's he, tough. He should, right? Yeah. And my mom was like, Y'all, he good, y'all, you know, let him in, da 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 da. It was really <laughs> that. He come in, yeah. he's sweating because he's scared. <laughs> and he was like, Look, man, I never recruited you because I ain't had I ain't feel like I had a chance to get you. Mm -hmm. So he said, if you want to come to North Carolina Central, I would love to have you. I just remember looking at my mom's face and she said, I just want you out of these projects. Mm -hmm. And seeing that from your mom and hearing that from your mom, it was, it hit different. 
Mm-hmm. I signed a scholarship right there on my kitchen table, sight unseen. The next day, it's in the paper, like, Moten going to North Carolina Central? Like, what's going on? Yeah. So I just remember praying and saying, God, like, please let me like this place. Mm-hmm. Like, I ain't seen it. I ain't done nothing. Mm-hmm. So I get up here in the summer, and I like it, right? It's like, yo, I can, I can dig this. And my freshman year was really, really tough. It was really humbling because we had a lot of talented people. I'm coming in as this big hot shot freshman. And we literally had 14 dudes that you could just play at any time. Mm-hmm. We start off 18 and 0. I'm playing like six, seven minutes a game. I'm frustrated. And I'm not frustrated because I'm not doing what I'm supposed to, to do. I'm frustrated because I'm doing everything I'm supposed to do, but I'm just not playing. Mm-hmm. Right? Mind you, I'm 17 years old. Mm-hmm. I was a young freshman. Mm-hmm. The guy that's playing in front of me is 24. Right, so he's a grown man, Damn. and he's from the area. Yeah, and he deserved to play, like because everybody was talented. But my coach called me in the office and he said, "I gotta play him because he's from Durham." Yeah. Right, and I ain't understand that politic because my entire life it was about whoever the best was. Right, one game my freshman year, he put me in the lineup. I scored twenty points in sixteen minutes. The yeah. next game, he don't even play me. You see what I'm saying? So like, this is what I'm going to do. Like, yeah. I ain't just over here pouting because, you know, I just, you know, my feelings. Like, no, I'm I'm pissed because I'm producing. I ended up having like five points as a freshman. But my sophomore year, going into my sophomore year, I was like, I can't do it anymore. At Carolina, my cousin is MVP of the Final Four now. Yeah. And so they just beat Michigan. And he's on the high. And I'm always comparing myself to him, right, because I got to catch him. Hmm. He's coming home and he's a rock star and I'm over here like I ain't even playing at North Carolina Central, right? So yeah. I'm hurt. Coach calls me that summer. I'm going to go to North Carolina State because North Carolina State said, we always wanted you anyway. Hmm. So now they're getting off probation. They said, you can always come up here. I'm about to go to North Carolina State and Coach hears the rumors. He called me and he said, what's this I hear about you transferring? I said, man, I'm not transferring because I'm running from adversity. I'm transferring because... You're not giving me a true shot, but you know what I'm saying? You're playing yeah. politics and I can't, I can't, I gotta feed my family. I can't do it. Yeah. And so he said, I'll let you have freedom and I'll let you do what your cousin have done. So the next year, I go from averaging five points a game to 19, mm-hmm. and then from 19 to 26. And, you know what I'm saying? So I'm like, yo, that you already knew it wasn't me because you don't just go from five to 19, right? Mm-hmm. You just, if you wasn't any good, if you just go from five to nineteen, if you caught in the crossfires of, of so many people having to play, and it was a really successful team, man. We won three championships in four years here. I'm proud that I got my degree mm-hmm. right on time. People don't appreciate opportunity unless a paycheck is connected, connected to, to it. it. Yeah, right? very true. That ain't, yeah. That ain't how it is, right? Just because you're a good player doesn't mean you're going to be a good coach, mm-hmm. right? There's an art and science to it. When you're forced to make a major decision, if the first question that you ask is what will other people think of you, then you're not even living your life. You're, you're just performing for acceptance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How many people do we know didn't do something that they were more than capable of because they were scared how other people would view them? You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was a project kid, so I got tired of being in that bubble trying to be validated and confirmed by other people because nobody ever accepted me anyway. But I really didn't know the art and science of teaching kids. Mm -hmm. All I knew is to overcompensate for what I didn't know. I had to show them I really cared so much. Mm -hmm. And that's why people gravitated to me. It ain't what you know. It's how much they know you care about them before they even bother to learn. And that's why a lot of players who go into coaching aren't successful because they didn't learn. Two plus two is four, but how do you teach someone that two plus two is four? Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Jerry Staghouse and other NBA, train, other NBA players come up and say, man, won't you help train us? So now I'm an NBA trainer on the side. You see what I'm saying? So I have all these things. So the only difference, I didn't record all of my workouts and things like that. I always customized it. I really just chose a player, dissected his game, and went and wrote a lesson plan and a professional development plan on how I'm going to prove his ability. And I went out there and said, listen, 
It's May right now, but by July, here's where we're going to be. You're going to be able to do X, Y, Z. And those guys appreciated it, man. And it was really customized. And so I look at trainers now and I see everybody just going in the gym saying, I bet you can't do this move for an hour. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> that's, no, that's very true. Training. Very, very true. Yeah, very true. I agree. Very true. Yeah. So I try to be like the OG. <laughs> Nobody wants to listen, but... yeah. To my knowledge, I was the first one in Raleigh really doing it. Parents and everyone else. If a trainer don't have a customized packet on your child and how he's going to improve this kid, hmm. they're not training your child. They, they just, y'all just going through the motions. You're not improving. Hmm. How do I know how to improve what you need to learn if I ain't never read and saw you play basketball? Yeah. Dissected your game and broke that down. I'll give you a prime example. You know, I had the opportunity to be with Steph and Chris Paul and, you know, Stack and Sheed and, like, some incredible basketball players and training. Mm -hmm. John Wall, PJ. I can't take credit for them. That's God-given, right? Yeah, yeah. When John made the All-Star the first time, ESPN called me and said, look, John wanted me to call you. Um, he said you had a huge influence on his game and so on and so forth. What did you do to get John Wall to this point? I said nothing. <laughs> God, you know what I'm saying? If I could do that for John Wall, I would have done it for myself. Like I'm not taking credit for John Wall's success or nothing like that, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's crazy. But a kid that was probably my favorite kid to train was Danny Green. Mm -hmm. Danny Green had been cut by the Spurs maybe three years in a row. Mm -hmm. My wife is pregnant. He calls me at twelve o'clock in the morning. He said, "Man, can you meet me at the Dingo?" Now I'm rolling over in the bed telling my wife, I'm <laughs> training. She's looking like, yeah, we, I'm going with you too. So <laughs> she's pregnant. We go to the gym. Danny's in the gym. Mm. And I just, we start off working. He going through his little combination dribbles. And I, I stop him and I said, DG, I said, man, you got to trust me on this. If you continue to do the same things you've always done, you're going to get the same results. And that's the true definition of insanity. Mm. I said, the Spurs have these guys by the name of Tony Parker, Manu Ginobili, and Tim Duncan mm. that they pay $100 million to to score this basketball. Mm. What the Spurs need is someone who's going to be able to knock down a shot whenever they get double teamed or they kick this ball. Mm -hmm. And I said, so we're not doing all these combination dribbles. Yeah. And he got pissed off at me, right? And so, but to his credit, he bought in. And we worked and we worked and we worked. And DG, I wouldn't let him leave the gym until he made 10 jumpers in a row and they couldn't touch the rim. Mm -hmm. Because I said, when they throw it to you, you got to make three out of five shots, man. Like, you got to. You got to make 60% of your open looks if you're going to make that team. He goes back to the Spurs. He make the team that year. Mm -hmm. Now they're in the NBA Finals, and he break the NBA um, three-point finals record, right? Mm -hmm. He was on fire. And me and him got a great relationship to this day. But those are the stories on why you need to customize and tailor this thing for that person's game in order to improve, you know, their skill level. And so that's what I did, too. So that's kind of everything that in a big melting pot of coaching. So mm -hmm. now three years, we win championships all three years at West Memphis. Mm -hmm. I'm bored. Right. It, I'm coaching against science teachers, man. That don't mean you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, down, I'm a good coach. I have some really good kids. I send a um, resume and apply for some head coaching positions on the high school level. I get rejection letters from three different high schools. Mm -hmm. Millbrook, Leesville, Knightdale. Mm -hmm. They all hit me with the thank you, but no thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, hey, like y'all just, <laughs> it's like that. I still got those letters now. Yeah. At the time, Sanderson High School is open. I apply. The principal at, at the time is Kathy Moore. Mm -hmm. Kathy Moore was my 10th grade French teacher at Enloe High School. Mm -hmm. I apply for the job. She tells me, I'm going to give you this job because ever since you were 16 years old, I thought there was something really special about you. She's not a superintendent of Wake County Public Schools, right? Mm -hmm. She gave me a job. Oh, wow. Now, the only thing about Sanderson is that they terrible. Like, you, they terrible. <laughs> like, it's, and this this is kind of foreshadowing your future, too. Yeah, you know, they, 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 they <laughs> terrible. This foreshadows your future. It's meant for me to come in here. I'm like, what? But I'm just happy to have a job. But yeah. now I got to compete with schools whose, whose district is that big. Yeah. 
The first year we go 500. We play Millbrook. They beat us by like 45, mm. right? 40. It just it felt bad. The next year we were gradually better. And we go to Millbrook and I got some heat with me now. Yeah. We beat them by 50. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, that's how I have to go. Yeah. And we won two championships at Sanderson in three years. Now North Carolina Central is calling me because they're making the transition from Division Two to Division One mm-hmm. for me to come be the coach, mm-hmm. the assistant coach. Yeah. A lot of people don't know this. I declined North Carolina Central three times. I said, nah, y'all stop calling me. I'm good. Mm-hmm. The reason I did it because I come from a loyal background. Kathy Moore had gave me a chance when nobody thought it was popular. Mm-hmm. So I was going to stick and ride it out with her. She called me into her office. She said, LaBelle, what's this I hear about you rejecting North Carolina Central three times? Mm-hmm. And I was like, I'm loyal. Like, you know me. You gave me a chance when nobody else did. She said, I understand that. Mm-hmm. She took both of her hands and put them on my face like this. She said, let me tell you something. And you know, like when a woman does that, that instantly break you down to like five years old, right? Yeah, no cap. She, like, <laughs> she said, what you have to offer this world is greater than Sanderson High School. You need to go take that job. So I go to North Carolina Central. I'm the assistant coach for two years during the transition. It's the worst basketball experience I ever had in my life. And I mean that as respectfully I, I, as I can. And we're the worst team in the nation, bro. Like, it was so hard to, like, we just don't have the talent level. <laughs> <laughs> it's bad, man. Like, it's, like, we're like the bad news bears of basketball. That's the only way I could put it. And I'm like, yo, what did I just do? After two years, they elect to go in another direction for my head coach. Hmm. I think we were two and twenty nine or two and thirty. Two and twenty nine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really? I don't even know how we got to two. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness! Two. We, we were two and twenty nine. Like uh-huh. it was awful, man. And so we're not in the conference. Yeah. So we got to go out and just play guaranteed games, man. We're getting beat to death, bro. Mm-hmm. Like it's horrible. Like these these kids, their esteem, their mentality, like they're done. They psych, they psyche is just done. They they part they part ways with my head coach Henry Dickinson. Mm-hmm. And so I called Miss Moore back. And I said, Can I come get my job back at <laughs> 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 just... come here anyway? You, know, you what told me come to she was like she said, Baby, your your job is gone. She said, Won't you apply for the job at North Carolina Central? Uh, and now I'm dating my current wife now. Uh, and um, my wife was like, Won't you put your name in the hat? I said, babe, like we were two and twenty nine. Like I was a part of that. Who's gonna hire <laughs> that, right? And then the year before, we might have been one and thirty one. Like we were horrible, bro. <laughs> and she said, so what? Like just you're a man of faith. Put your name in the hat. You never know what will happen. Mm-hmm. In her mind, God has led me up to this point without me really even knowing. It. Mm-hmm. I, I apply for the position. They tell me I get an interview. It's every coach in the country trying to get a D1 job. There's only 350 of them, so everybody and their mom trying to get a job. Mm. I go to the committee, and it's a committee of eight people. They never ask me a basketball question. Mm. They all ask me about being a CEO. How would I teach? How would I manage? How would I fundraise? How would I bring notoriety and publicity? Mm. How will I turn the program around, so on and so forth? And I told them, I said, if you hire me in five years, we'll win a MEAC championship, we'll be the ACC school, and we'll go to the Sweet 16, right? Because mm-hmm. I ain't had nothing else to say. I ain't had no history of nothing. <laughs> so I'm just in there trying to Muhammad Ali my way, just predict what's going to happen, right? Yeah. And I remember my chancellor called me in the office before they were going to announce the hire, Charlie Nance. And he said, I know you know like I know you know basketball like the back of your hand. My only concern is are you tough enough? It's gonna to take a while to beat. Mm-hmm. And are you gonna be able to handle now social media is coming in play? Mm-hmm. And they say you stink and you suck and <laughs> you know, you should be fired and so on and so forth. The boo birds and the criticism, are you gonna be handled and equipped to handle that? Mm-hmm. I said, Man, if I ain't anything in life, I'm tough enough. Mm-hmm. He said, congratulations, you're going to be the coach. So I was hired March 25th, 2009. On March 26th, I almost got fired, right? Because my AD <laughs> called. <laughs> and it's like, it's, 
nobody wanted me to be the coach. Man. Like it wasn't, it wasn't a popular decision. I'm the youngest coach in the country. I don't have no experience. Mm -hmm. Just like, what y'all doing? We going tra transition. We need people with experience who've been through him, blah, blah, blah. So the alumni, everybody giving everybody here. Like, why we mm -hmm. hire homie? Like, I know he can hoop, but that don't mean he could coach and da, da, da. And this ain't no middle school kids and this ain't high school kids. This is college young men. And yeah. So my AD calls and says, I need you to go to lunch with two of our boosters and donors who didn't feel like you were worthy of the job. Mm -hmm. And I want you to show them that you were more than capable of having this job. Man, once you come from a place where nobody accepts and validates you, you just get so tired of trying to please people. You know what I'm saying? I said, I'm not going to do that. I said, if they have a problem with me, that's their problem, not mine. Mm. Like if I went to lunch with everyone who didn't like or accept Lavelle Mo, I'd be going to lunch with somebody every day. They ain't, everybody ain't like Jesus Christ. So why they think? Why I think they gonna like me? I said, Nah, I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm grateful for her because she accepted it. Five years later, we beat NC State. Mm -hmm. We win the MEAC tournament and we go to the NCAA tournament. And those promises that I made to that committee came true. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, NC I told him we're going to be the ACC school. Mm -hmm. When I took over the job, the average margin of defeat for us was 42 points a game. Think about that. Mm -hmm. Right? So that means every time we set foot out here, you can go ahead and put 42 for the other team up there. It's 42 nothing when we start. That's how bad <laughs> it was, bro. And so I was like, we got to change this thing, man. And I was able to get some incredible basketball players that came in here and helped me shape and mold this thing. And it was a fight. Like, I, I was pushing them. Like, it was C.J. Wilkinson, Pooby Chapman, like, Dominique Sutton. Like, those dudes, man, mm -hmm. they came here. I had to push them dudes. I was I was in the midst of chaos. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, like, I had to fight. My back was against the wall to get this program up and running. And at the same time, you see these incredible guys, and they don't know how incredible they are. You're not here to be their friend. You're not here to have relationships with them and all. Like, that's not what you're here for. My job to be your coach and prepare you for this real world that's waiting out here. And uh, that's what I tried to do, man. If you want to be great, I'm going to hold you to that. And I'm going to push you every single day to be great. And so it's worked, man. It's, you know, it's worked. And, and so I'm never going to compromise who I am because I think that's what's wrong with our generation. Our leaders, they compromise who they are now, right? Mm -hmm. The leaders, the coaches, the parents. The teachers, everybody want to be the kids' friends. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Everybody yeah. want a relationship with them, and I don't want no relationship with you, mm. right? When I when I came out my when I was here, my coach went one way, I went the other. I see you right here, right? Because this is what I signed up for. This is really a business transaction, mm. right? Mm. I'm giving you a scholarship with the expectation that you're coming out here to do your job. All that personal stuff that ain't. That ain't in for it. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? And so we, mm -hmm. we personalized way too much. And in my humble opinion, we made this generation softer, mm -hmm. right? And now, once they become softer and do things that's out of the ordinary, we say, man, these kids crazy. No, you were crazy because you didn't do what you're supposed to do as a leader in order to mold and shape that young man or that woman to get them where they needed to go. Mm -hmm. You know, like... What, what do you what do you look for in a kid like when you're recruiting somebody to play to be an eagle and play play under you? What are what, when you're out recruiting? What elements are you looking for in a kid? Man, that's a good question. Um, you know, the obvious you want them to be able to play, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I really look for character and not characters, mm -hmm. right? Like it, there's a difference, and I really like seeing kids when things don't go their way. Everybody who signs up for this, they ain't really built for it. The thing is, people are always committed to something as long as it's all good. My mom taught me that commitment is doing what you said you were going to do long after the mood and what you said it did is gone. Now, are you still committed, right? Mm -hmm. And so I like to see the adversity at these AAU tournaments and high school games. How do you respond when you're going three for 16 now? How do you help your team win? Because it's the little things on this level that separates one man from the next. If I took someone's bio and put my hand over the name, mm -hmm. everybody's bio looked the same. McDonald, McDonald's All-American nominee, honorable <laughs> mention, uh, first team All-Conference, second team all set. Like All that stuff looks the same. Yeah. Like, so you can't really tell it apart until you uncover that name. right? And so 
people so focused on the measurables. I, I focus on the things that you can't see, the intangibles. How tough are you? Like, do you energize your teammates? Or do you go to the sideline and do you pout when things don't go your way? I look at your parents, right? Mm -hmm. Are they helicopter parents? Are they cussing the referee out from the stands every time they baby don't mm -hmm. <laughs> don't get something done? Because now you're going to try to bring that here, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's just who you are. All of those things play a major, major factor in how we recruit. Mm -hmm. And we don't necessarily have a perfection rate of it. Mm -hmm. I've taken the chances on some kids that I shouldn't have taken the chance on, mm -hmm. and it burnt me. But I've taken the chance on some kids that no one else believed in, and it benefited us, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's always like the roll of the dice, but I, I just don't think you can ever compromise your morals and your value system because I tell my staff, we can miss out on the kid, and that kid might beat us once or twice a year. Mm -hmm. But if you bring the wrong kid in here, he gonna beat you every day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, he, gonna yes. he gonna beat you every day, bro. So yeah. let's bring in people that we want to be around. Mm -hmm. I'm a little older now, so I'm not as young as as I once was, and accepting as I once was. So I just like being around good people, right? Who have shared values and things of that nature. And I know we can go out here on this court and win together. You had Chris Paul in here with the um, Why Not Us. Um, and I, you know, I saw like kind of you talking about like NC State, Duke. I go to NC State currently. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. NC State, Duke, uh, UNC, you know, like these these other programs. I kind of like how like every year you, you're transforming like Central into like a respectable program and leading them to the tournament, the Max Kellerman thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. a lot of people see it. What, what's kind of um, the message Chris Paul is kind of trying to convey and what's you guys' relationship? I've known Chris Paul since Chris Paul was seven years old. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, he might have been younger than that, right? Mm -hmm. Him and his brother CJ, I, I I knew both of them. Like one of my homeboys used to date their babysitter, mm -hmm. and I would ride up there to <laughs> with my homeboy, right? And I ain't know it was Chris Paul and CJ Paul. They were just two sliding those kids or whatever, whatever. Yeah. And we would all just get together. And, you know, I was a kid myself. I was sixteen, seventeen, or whatever, and we just had fun. Mm -hmm. And now they became who they came became. And he comes back. He called me from the bubble. Mm -hmm. um, no, he was about to head to the bubble. What was this, like a year and a half ago or something like that? Mm -hmm. He said, man, hold tight. When I get back from this bubble, I need to talk to you about some things. Like, I got an idea. So he goes to the bubble. At the time, I'm getting all these production companies starting to call me. Like, what the fuck <laughs> is going on? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's on the heels of the George Floyd death. Shout out to Chris and CJ Paul um, and Ron and Mike, like in ESPN and Bob Iger and Stephen A. Smith, mm -hmm. right? Stephen A. called me. He was like, because initially he wasn't a, an, an executive producer. Mm -hmm. And then he came on. He said, man, let me tell you something, my brother. He said, man, you special, bro. I want you to always know that you special. And hearing that from him, I was like, all right, cool. He said, man, I want to come along board and, and you know, put my time, energy, and effort into this project because he was a, you know, he was a Winston-Salem grad, right? Mm -hmm. So he already knew what it looked like, what it felt like. He played under the legendary Big House games. And I knew Stephen A. from 1996, mm -hmm. right? So, like, we would go up to Philadelphia and watch, you know, me and Jerry Stackhouse was best friends. Mm -hmm. And so in that gym, when he was with the Sixers in the summer, it was always Allen Iverson, Kobe, all the sixes, right? Mm -hmm. So Stephen A was just a beat writer for the Philadelphia Inquirer. He would hang with us, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so he's blossoming into his career. So he's never forgotten that. I never forgotten that, and I'm I'm super proud of him. So it was all these people coming into to the table to say, "Lo, we believe in you, man. Let's make this happen." And that's how Why Not Us was born. You spent some time with the USA on Central on that. I think you coached. Um, so I walked on at Alabama my mm -hmm. freshman year. Kyra. Of Kyle, yeah, Kyra Lewis, yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, I know about the him, and I remember we played Kansas State, mm -hmm. and I remember the locker room. He's like, "Yeah, it's time." I was like, "What are you talking about?" He's like, "It's time." Just know it's time. We got the win, and um, you know, he's you know he has a lot of respect for you, obviously, and uh, yeah. So, how was it? You know, that experience with USA and Kyra. I think he had a he had a, he had a pretty good rookie year, but I think this upcoming year is going to be big for him with Herb down there now as well. It was one of the most amazing experiences. For 2015, that was my first. 
stint out there at USA. Yeah. You got the Josh Jacksons, Jason Taylor, mm -hmm. Harry Giles, like <laughs> Oh yeah. Brunson, like these kids are incredible basketball players. Yeah. So you go to training camp, they got a hundred kids, and our job is to cut it down to twelve kids yeah. in three days. Yeah. It's hard. You know what I'm saying? And so the first time I was out there, Sean Miller was the head coach. And then the second time I went out there was 2019. Mm -hmm. And I became the first HBCU coach to be assistant coach. We get to camp, and I'm, I, I've only s seen and heard about some of these dudes, right? But I don't know them, so I don't have no bias at all. First time seeing Kay Cunningham. First time seeing Jalen Green. Mm -hmm. First time seeing Evan Mobley. I'm like, you know, these dudes are all right. Scotty Barnes, all these cats. So now we got a selected team. Yeah. That's the hardest process ever because so much talent. So much talent. Yeah. And now you're really not even collecting talent. You're just saying who can have the best chemistry and synergy amongst them to get us out of, you know, this because you know, like the most talented teams don't win. We go to Greece and I had a chance to spend a lot of time, you know, with Kate Cunningham, Tyrese Halliburton, Evan Mobley, Reggie Perry, all oh, Jalen Green, all these guys, Scotty Barnes, these dudes were the top five, six picks in the draft, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was an amazing experience for me because I needed sometimes iron sharpens that well, iron sharpens iron. And sometimes in a coach's role, everyone always come to you for the answers and the solutions and so on and so forth, and you make all the decisions. Mm -hmm. I needed to be in a place where I could grow, mm -hmm. right? And so seeing this amazing talent, man. Um, you know, it was it was crazy once it came to the table. But I also had this in the back of my mind. If we don't win a gold medal, they gonna blame me mm -hmm. because I'm the first, mm -hmm. right? I'm the first HBCU coach and da-da-da. Now nobody else will ever get a chance probably. Mm -hmm. And so I took it really personal. And so Kay would be like, Coach, relax, we got it. Jalen Suggs. I'm like, no, we ain't got it. <laughs> I need my gold medal player. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, we're going at it. And I was coaching them hard. I was coaching them hard. And Coach Weber and, and, and Mike, who's at Washington, they needed that. You know, I needed to be that guy because I could relate to the guys. And they respected it. Mm. But we also had to push them because we had business to take care of. Mm. Now we're all the best of friends. You know, I love them all. Man, it's so wonderful to see these guys walk across the stage and change the dynamic of their family structure for generational wealth. Like, that's the most beautiful thing, man. And so mm -hmm. they all text and stay in touch with me and they see in jerseys and so on and so forth, man. And so mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's really gratifying and humbling to be a part of that experience, man, because everybody don't get that opportunity. Like, who's walking around Raleigh with a gold medal or, you know, where I'm from Lane Street. Lane, you don't come from Lane Street and get a gold medal. Like, who does that, right? But mm -hmm. so I had that opportunity, and I'm extremely fortunate and, and blessed to, to be able to do it. I always ended off with um, a game. <laughs> so I asked five questions. I did with David, uh, Pooby, and some other people. Mm -hmm. So I just asked five questions. Yeah. Got it. it has to be an authentic answer. So we'll start it off difficult. MJ LeBron is the GOAT. <laughs> we'll go off the rip hard with it. <laughs> MJ or LeBron. MJ or LeBron. Yeah. If I had to start a basketball team with any player that's ever played, I'm mm -hmm. starting with LeBron. All right, we're going to take uh, two uh, amazing guards from here. Um, John Wall and Chris Paul. Um, both for their prime. I know you have a good relationship with both. Uh, <laughs> I know this is going to be hard. I know this is going to be hard. You know, actually, this answer, I won't even push you this position. You just, you could just, um, you kind of just describe both, but in their primes, the, the question was going to be, in their primes, who would you build a team around? And one of them's going to hate you. <laughs> I know that's a hard, you can't answer that one, kid. You're my dog. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you this about John Wall. A lot of people don't know this. John was, you see the, you see who he is now, mm -hmm. and you think he's always been that way because we look at people and say, yo, since they were kids, they were that. Mm -hmm. it wasn't the case. John came to my basketball camp. He was a younger, like he, you know, he was one of my little young protégés, right? And I had like one of the biggest camps in North Carolina at the time. Everybody came. I let all the hood kids in the free. Mm -hmm. 
hmm. right? And John's from my part of town. He's from, from Southside. In the first year John was at camp, like I had my homeboys refereeing and stuff like that. John is cussing out the, the, the refs. Like he 12 <laughs> cussing them out. Like you call travel, he'd be like, F you. You know what I'm saying? Crazy. Like what? Man, I threw that dude in CJ Lens. I threw him out of my camp. I said, man, y'all can't come back here. Y'all crazy. You know what I'm saying? Like I let you in for free. You can't, you can't, you can't be out here acting like that. Hmm. I see his mom at the flea market. God rest her soul, Miss Francis. I see her the following year. She said, Vail, let my baby back in camp and da-da-da. I'm like, no, your baby crazy. Like, he ain't coming back here. And she said, somebody helped you and da-da. And when she said it, the way she said it, she was exactly right. We all deserve second chances. Hmm. And John came back to camp. And now he's 6'3". Hmm. He got a 40 in the first grade. <laughs> <laughs> he's fast as lightning. Yeah. One thing he could always do was handle the ball because this is the time where all the and one stuff was out, right? Mm -hmm. And so all these kids had their little tricks, but he wasn't fast. He wasn't elite quick. Like, he was none of that. Mm -hmm. Then he came back, and he just, the fastest with a 40-inch vertical. And so he's having an incredible camp, by far the best player there. And so I would go referee his game. Mm -hmm. and I'm going to pick out him now, right? I'm calling travels. I'm, I'm seeing if his attitude has changed. And... I called Travel on him, and he just looked, and he put the ball down and ran down the floor and got back on the, mm -hmm. right? And so I called another bogus call on him. He's like, all right, don't worry about it, y'all. Y'all come on back. Let's get it. I was like, yo, this kid is like, sky's the limit now. Because all he had to change was his attitude. What I realized now was that he wasn't being intentionally disrespectful. He was just like me in terms of crying out for – a male figure, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing, the same way I needed Ron Williams, he needed me at that time. Mm -hmm. Somebody else needed somebody else. It takes that community to, to, to bring these kids together. For him to go create generational wealth for his family after all he's been through, I love that boy, man. I'm so super proud of him, right? And so, but I still say him and Chris, man, like, <laughs> not just to get me, Chris. <laughs> And not Chris Paul, I think like he's he's underrated in my opinion. I mean, you know, OKC, mm -hmm. you know, leading up, they weren't even supposed to be like a top a top ten team in the West. People you know, and they went New Orleans, Chris. Uh, it's and I was talking to David about that. Right. You know, like me and David was talking Chris about was that. Monster man, well, him and D West. Oh, oh my God, he understands the angles. I don't know if there's a better cerebral point guard that's ever played the game outside of Chris, man. So enough respect to both of them. I got to go on tie with that. I'm sorry. I was going to do on the former players you coached at, uh, during the USA time, the Kyras, you know, um, Kyra Lewis, uh, Jalen Green, Kay Cunningham. What do you think is selling for those guys? The sky's the limit because it's some, mm -hmm. like the thing with Kyra. Ky Kyra was so young. Kyra was a baby. <laughs> you know, and I mean, no disrespect to him. He was just a – he was like me when he came out. He was just – the youngest in his class. He mm -hmm. should have been in their class, right? And, but he's already in college going through the things and people and expect more from him because he had a college jersey on as opposed to an AAU jersey. Mm -hmm. I'm like, nah, he's supposed to be in an AAU jersey, man. So mm -hmm. I have a lot of respect for him because he didn't. He took a back seat to those guys at USA Basketball. Mm -hmm. He saved us one game against Lithuania because they were playing the zone, and he came in and knocked down like three threes and got him out that zone real quick. Mm -hmm. And so seeing him, I think the sky's the limit for him because he got so much room to grow because you don't reach your ceiling as a point guard until you're 25, 26 years old. Mm -hmm. Kay Cunningham, same thing. Jalen Green, like he's such a different player. He came off the bench for us, right? And so mm -hmm. it was Cade and Jalen. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm like, it's that's not even close. Hmm. But now Jalen kind of bridged that gap a little bit, man, right? And yeah. he's been working. And, and Cade is going to be phenomenal too, man. Like, all of them. I think the sky's the limit for all of them, man, because they're incredibly, incredibly talented kids. Who do you think is going to win the NBA Finals this upcoming season? <laughs> that was the last I got it. I had to end it on that. Yeah, you're going to naturally say the Nets – and the Lakers. Oh, man, PJ so. texts me. PJ texts me <laughs> after the game. And, uh, you know, we always, we, we talk a lot. That's like, you know, that's like my little brother, man. And, uh, you know, we from the same same place. We from the same way. Hmm. And he just like, there. 
it's nothing I can do. <laughs> like, <laughs> normally it's force him right, force him left. Well, body him up. No, he's like, man, it's, it's just nothing you can do with this dude. We just got to hope he missed. So I was like, listen, man, the only chance you have with KD is to hope that he's worn down in the fourth quarter because he got to do so much because James Harden's not out there, right? Mm-hmm. He going to embarrass you those other three quarters because there's nothing <laughs> you can do, right? Yeah. So can you imagine picking up the best scorer on the planet that ever existed in a lot of people's opinion? Mm-hmm. And your family out here watching you guard that man every, like, <laughs> come on, right? you know the heart that you got to have to do that. So I got nothing but love and respect for, for, for PJ because most people guarding Kevin Durant would sprain their ankle. <laughs> After the first quarter, they said, coach, get me out of here, my ankle. Like, there ain't nothing wrong with your ankle. You're just getting cooked. But you know, that's, that's just what it is. So um, to answer, man, I, I think it would be the Nets and the Lakers. And, and I, I think it will go seven. Whoever got home court advantage will win. Okay. Yeah, that's fair enough. I mean, y'all heard it, you know, from the man himself. <laughs> you know, I'm definitely going to try to catch some games. I don't, well, I'll ask you off camera. I don't know how you guys are doing, nah, you know, media. Anytime, anytime. You're always welcome up here. For always sure. Welcome. I appreciate that. I'm definitely going to try to be in here. FA out. Oh, yeah. Like, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Tune in to Central Games this year. Special group. You know, Chris Monroe, a lot of guys I'm following. So, you guys, you guys tune in. So.